Hello, I'm D Quiggs, and this is Good Doe Blitz Tutorial. Today, we're going to be discussing the animation player. Um, this is going to be a really brief, basic rundown, so let's go ahead and get right into it. The first thing we're going to do here, we're going to go ahead and add an animation player. And I want to just demonstrate how to uh, go ahead and animate a sprite here, for example. So in the animation player, we're going to go ahead and go to animate. We're going to get hit new, and I'm going to call this run. Now, if we go into our sprite, I have a sprite sheet loaded. The way you use sprite sheets, um, I'm just going to touch on this real fast so i have a 3 by 16 sprite sheet so the way you set that up is you go into animation set 3 16 and now you have sprite frame what's great about godot 3.11 is it auto advances your sprite frame as you add it into the track over here um because it used to be a real pain in the ass you used to have to set them all manually. Once you'll notice is you have your animation player selected is that now if you have a track up you have all these keys. So you use these keys to actually animate these properties inside the animation player. So for animating um, our running animation, we're gonna go ahead and use frame. So we're gonna add that. It's gonna say that, we're gonna say yes. Um, so now it should auto advance according to our step right here. So what you wanna do is actually go ahead and create that and just knock out that first sprite frame. For some reason it won't advance automatically um, on that first one, but once you have this track up, we can go ahead and we can click it, click it, click it, click it, click it, and it will automatically advance. Now, also interesting to note, if you have like systematic sprite sheets where like the character animations are lining up in the same frame for multiple mobs or enemies, you can very quickly and easily just highlight all of these and you can always duplicate keys in another area or you can duplicate your entire animation right here and just call it something different. Um, in this case, it auto defaults to parentheses copy. However, you can always edit that with the rename function. So here's all your file system functions for the actual animations themselves. So that way you can save them as individual animations and back them up and use them in other places. Things important to know here is A, your step. This is the interval in which you can actually control things and the interval in which things occur. This is your overall duration. Even if you have stuff out here, if it's not within the overall duration, it will not occur. Another thing to note is that when you're working with frames, it's something that you don't want to have an in-between number it has to be a whole number and for things like that you want to use discrete however when you're animating a number you want to use continuous and for example what we're going to go ahead and do is we'll add a light 2d node so for example energy is a value that is a, a numerical value so for this one we want to go ahead and pop this in and we want to have this on continuous by setting this to continuous, it'll graduate in between the first value and the second value or whatever values are in between the keyframes. Also, whenever you click one of these, you can go in and edit their properties manually over to your right. So what I'm going to go ahead and do is actually modulate this down to 0 0.1. And now when we go ahead and press it, you see his face, you see the glow gradually disappearing from his face. So another thing to note is you have nearest, linear, and cubic. So of course, nearest is going to be what you want to use for sprite frames. I'm going to go ahead and switch that over. Um, linear and cubic, usually if your animation just kind of doesn't seem natural, can't quite put your finger on why, go ahead and try switching this over to cubic. Because that's typically the issue there. In real life, things work more in a, in a cubic function type way, um, an exponential versus just a straight linear um, progression. And the final thing that's very important to note is your loop function. So if you loop an animation, when it ends, it'll automatically go back to the beginning. The last thing to know is probably going to be this loop wrap mode with clamp, in which basically every time it ends, it's going to reset back to the beginning. And then you have loop wrap mode. So if you see this, now it's very gradual. And what's happening here is in loop mode, this is actually going to fade back into this versus in wrap mode when the animation ends, it's going to reset itself automatically to what it was. Really, really fast, I'm just gonna go ahead and cover um, just a really easy, quick animation controller. So basically what you're just gonna wanna do is you wanna set up a function that you pass um, the animation change to, and if the current animation is not equal to the new animation, then you wanna go ahead and uh, call your animation player to play it and set your current animation to your new animation. The reason you want to do this is uh, by doing this and handling everything through here, A, you have a function that you can use to add in different things when this occurs. And then also you don't want your animations playing a million times, especially if they call code. 
which is what we're about to get into next. So the next most important thing and probably like just life changing thing in Godot is using the animation player to call code. So what we can do here, for example, is we can go ahead and we're going to change this over to a uh, rigid body. Now I'm just going to demonstrate this. Um, nobody's going to use this in this way. So just for example purposes, what I'm going to do is I assigned a collision shape. So at the end of this run animation, I'm actually going to call the code to disable that collision shape at which point the character should just start falling through the floor. What you want to go ahead and do is hit add track and then go down this call method track. From here, you want to select what object you want to call the method from. Um, so in this case, it's collision shape. Now, if we go down here, um, you see this, we have a green dot. So now if we right click and hit insert key, we get the select method menu. From here, we're gonna wanna hit set deferred. And set deferred and call deferred are gonna be, if you're dealing with your physics objects and collision shapes, you usually wanna use set deferred and call deferred. This way the changes occur during an idle step instead of during like the physics process, in which case like you can get all types of glitches and things phasing through stuff, it, it, it's a mess. Use set deferred, call deferred, and also it helps on performance. If you go over here, once you select this, then you can choose your number of arguments. And in this case, we need two arguments. And the first argument for set deferred is going to be disabled. And the second argument is going to be a Boolean. And that Boolean is going to be true. And now when we go ahead and play this animation, um, it should run. And then once it gets about here, the character should fall until it sinks into the ground and his uh, other collision shape catches him. So let's go ahead and see what happens. Running and there you go. And there you have it. And we still see him running and uh, flashing down there. Excellent. So that's how you use a call function track. So this was a used to set a property. Um, so also you can use call deferred and you can call pretty much any method or function. If you want to call your own method or function, you just click on the node that your script is attached to and call it from there. And then also if you have any issues or something just doesn't seem to be acting right or seems to be kind of weird, maybe performance is bad. Also you go in here and you have optimized animation. And you can either play around with this or just go ahead and optimize it. I know sometimes I'll have uh, frames get skipped and this pretty much ensures that those frames don't get skipped and usually makes uh, transition effects look a little bit smoother. You can also use these boxes here to just turn on and off effects if you want to do it quick without deleting the entire track. And then last but not least, the final thing I want to go over is signals. So it's very important, um, or it's very useful to have your animation player often to give you a signal when it, either the animation changes or the animation finishes. Um, you can often use this to go ahead and change into another animation, especially if it's a fighting game or something. Um, in which case, you hook this signal up and you can see here we have old name and new name. So you can use this to set up logic such as if the old name equals uh, prepare for punch, then the new name equals punch. Um, and then you can use this to link up your animation and then you can actually code for your collisions and your movements and stuff um, and any other things that might happen uh, all together at once. So that is overall the power of the animation player. And that's just a quick basic rundown. Um, from here, your imagination should be able to go wild and figure out how to use it. If you like that, go ahead and give me a thumbs up. If you did not like that, go ahead and smash your computer monitor and then give me a thumbs down. But I do believe if you thumbs down the video, then you do owe me a picture of a smashed computer monitor. Um, if you're not subscribed, go ahead and subscribe every most days, 10.30 p.m. EST. I do development live streams. Feel free to come by, check it out, um, ask me questions. Um, until next time, I am Dequigs, and peace.